Um, welcome to the last session of, of this wonderful symposium. My name is Peter Davies and I'm the chair of, of this particular session. I'm here at Macquarie Uni in, in Sydney. And I, I, I come from a, a, a science background, but I do a lot of research in this cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary space. So I'm really excited about the uh, presentations that are coming up today. And we've got four wonderful presenters here, and I'll introduce them as they go as they go through. But very briefly, we've got at the first presentation from Judith Preston that's really focusing on some justice issues within Indigenous communities in Australia. And then we're moving through to a, a three-way presentation, largely looking at some social anthropology um, uh, connections and research within the Maori community in New Zealand. Uh, Trevor will then talk about the question of welfare and well-being and how that relates to you know, this question of sustainability um, and various legal instruments that have been applied in, in New Zealand. And then finally, we, we, we turn to Sri Lanka, where we're starting to think about this notion of ecocentrism. So that's where we'll go today. Um, so I would encourage all of you to use the question and answer um, bar as you've been doing throughout the symposium. And I'll sort of open those, check those, and we'll have the question and answer at the end. For the speakers, we've got 15 minutes. I'll give you a little wave at about 13 minutes. Then I'll wave sort of frantically at about 14, and then I'll be a little bit ruder at about 15, just to make sure everyone's got a, uh, got a uh, chance to, 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 share their, to share their presentations. So to begin with, we've got Judith Preston from um, over here in Sydney. And Judith is, is a, a, a colleague, if you like, and I've known Judith for a very long time. She's a, she's a solicitor admitted to the practice in both New South Wales and, and the Northern Territory. And she commenced her legal work in the Northern Territory Land Council um, some decades ago, where she was primarily representing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, Aboriginal traditional landowners in their land, land claims. She was also instrumental in establishing the first public interest environmental law centre, the Environmental Defenders Office in New South Wales in 1984 and 1985. And so there's a long history and connection there. Uh, she um, has her PhD, which she graduated in 2020, um, which explored the research question of how Indigenous knowledges can be effectively integrated into environmental decision making. So we really look forward to your talk. And Judith, I've given an abridged bio here. And if there's anything else I've left, please um, please add in. So the floor is yours. Thanks, Peter. I'll share the screen. Work. Right. So um, I might like move all you down over there. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about access to justice through um, an international program called the Indigenous Navigator Program. But before I do, I would like to acknowledge the Dharu people of the Eora Nation, uh, being on the, the traditional custodians of the country on which I'm meeting and some of you on Quarry University are meeting, and recognise their continuing connection to the unceded land and waters now known as Australia, and thank them for protecting that land and the water and its ecosystems. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present today. So just to say, I'm sorry if I uh, have too much content. Um, I'm happy to share the slides with anybody who wants and I put hyperlinks in just to, to put that caveat in case I run out of time. But Essentially, I'm talking about the Indigenous Navigator Program and how it relates to the themes of this conference. I've been um, interestedly listening to many of the sessions and uh, some of the content I've got covers uh, those kind of themes. So to talk about the Indigenous Navigator, it's, it's a fairly recent uh, initiative. It's a framework and set of tools uh, that's set up by Indigenous people and for Indigenous communities to monitor their human rights, essentially. But the human rights, of course, are linked to their environmental rights. And often many of the communities are human rights and environmental right defenders and all the problems that go with that. 
So anyone can access these free tools, essentially um, uh, questionnaires that assess these human rights. Um, and also once the data is collected, it automatically goes up onto the website and anyone can have a look at it. And also comparative reports are available. I mean, if any of you have looked at international convention websites, that's essentially a great benefit of, of those websites as well. You get to see what other countries are doing. You might even use that as uh, in your advocacy as well. So collaborative initiative between these groups and I'm sure many of you have heard of these, uh, these groups, the NGOs. The International Working Group on Indigenous Affairs, the IWGIA, is, is primarily the um, group that has spearheaded this along with the Danish Institute for Human Rights and supported and funded by the European Union. There is funding available and I have had a, a discussions with David Berger who works for IWGIA and he's happy to share that information. It seemed like a minefield to me, but if anybody's good at funding applications, I'm sure you will get a lot out of communication with him. So 21st century has been quite a blockbuster in terms of shifting legal thinking, in terms of the indigenous uh, issues space, as well as um, rights for nature and ecological jurisprudence. There's shifts in legal thinking, but also in jurisprudence, laws and cases. Um, but I'd have to say, generally speaking, my impression is that generally speaking, Indigenous people have a lack of access to justice and a lack of recognition of their rights, particularly biocultural rights, which leads to a denial of justice because the state fails to acknowledge their legal and moral existence. So many of the conflicts um, centre uh, Sustainable Development 16, which is achieving peace and justice, which is of course, very important in terms of having access to land and carrying out your cultural responsibilities and feeling that you can uh, speak your languages and uh, pass on that knowledge and, and those practices to next generations. Um, on a webinar I watched, uh, it was suggested the UN framework and guiding principles for business and human rights is a good guide and standard for say companies that uh, work in these uh, indigenous land and territories. But of course, that isn't always complied with by companies. So forward thinking constitutions are available, such as in um, Ecuador and Bolivia, um, and creative laws in Australia, New Zealand and India, which some of you are familiar with about uh, protecting riverine environments, uh, which look at Indigenous communities as custodians are available. But these legal developments are uh, not very effective if uh, NGOs and Indigenous communities uh, that um, inform them say that they need to implement this uh, or uh, make them effective through uh, activism and, and litigation, because there uh, is obviously a lot of risks and money and stress involved in, with those two things. So a paper I came across by Aaron MacDonald and others uh, had a good quote that said, that basically Indigenous and non-Western principles have been introduced into international law and national laws, of course, in the, uh, through the broader discourse of ecological jurisprudence. Uh, the rights of nature have often been facilitated by the rights of Indigenous people to self-determination, incorporating a right to sovereignty over natural resources. So the, the tools and the data that's collected through this program can be used for um, Indigenous protected areas um, and uh, the Paraku IPA in Western Australia is, is actually on the website of the Indigenous Community Conserved Areas, which is the broader category. And it's noted by O'Donnell, O'Donnell and others that the most transformative case of the rights of nature has been consistently influenced and often led by Indigenous people. I would note that the uh, indigenous community conserved areas also have toolkits which communities can use to help them look after um, their countries. So just a brief summary of how we got to the Indigenous Navigator uh, Initiative, the permanent forum on Indigenous issues proposed ways of identifying and adopting appropriate indicators for Indigenous identity land, ways of living and rights to and perspectives on development and well-being. 
Then there was uh, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People in 2007 and uh, 2014, the outcome document of the World Conference on Indigenous People's Rights. So both of these documents say that, well, reaffirm that states should be committed to supporting practical implementation of, of principles in these documents. But as I've said before, Indigenous people's rights remain disregarded, ignored. States have insufficiently reflected their rights in national legislation, policies and practices. And uh, Indigenous communities face violations, exclusion, marginalisation. So in 2015, uh, the Indigenous Peoples Major Group proposed a monitoring framework to reflect the rights of self-determination and equality. And one of the uh, main ways that uh, was proposed to achieve this is the development of this initiative. So tools uh, available um, on the a website uh, show how UNDRIP articles are directly linked to other international human rights and labour standards. Uh, there's a comprehensive guidance and uh, methodology on how to use the tools. It actually gives you the two uh, comprehensive questionnaires at uh, community level and national level. Uh, ideally, uh, people should be able to go into communities and, and, and sit down with people and explain what the purpose and uh, the outcome of these, uh, the information, but it can be done online. And of course, there are also so COVID issues uh, that will interrupt that. So as I said, there's a community index and a national index, and there is uh, a way of looking at uh, how different countries uh, comply with international human rights standards. So the benefits to communities of using this uh, method and process is that they're in control and uh, they can decide uh, whether they do it or not and also what to do with the data when it's um, been generated. So they have sovereignty over the data. It also contributes to working out what, how it will support their prioritised needs and formulate demands for their empowerment can be also used uh, for in, as an advocacy tool. So first phase of the pilot programs, 2014, uh, you can see the number of the six countries, Peru, Kenya, Cameroon, Suriname, Thailand and Nepal, nice uh, covering of different um, places. Um, the data supported the information gaps and, and uh, started discussions with governments, either local or uh, national and external stakeholders, which included getting how to get some funds for various projects they wanted. 2017, uh, there were a, another six countries, Bangladesh, Cambodia, the Philippines, Bolivia, Colombia and Tanzania. So focusing mainly on uh, South America, uh, Asia um, and Africa, but uh, as you can see, that none from the Pacific so far. The next phase will be Myanmar, Norway, Sweden and Finland, uh, and they've su suggested that they want to get involved. So 165 uh, questionnaires have been completed, uh, engagement of over 200 communities, four national surveys, so engaging over a quarter of a million people by the end of 2020, which is pretty, it's a pretty good start. So 57 uh, pilot projects led and carried out by Indigenous communities. They determine what is the priority. So it's a whole range of, of, of uh, projects. I've just here in this slide talk about in a report that's been produced by the uh, uh, Indigenous Navigator, and it talks about how climate change uh, impacts lively, uh, lives and livelihoods. So the projects strengthen uh, and determine whether UNDRIP's principles uh, have been applied in the local community con uh, context, addresses challenges in implementing the sustainable development goals, it strengthens traditional practices and knowledges such as agriculture, um, language use, and conservation, health practices. It also builds leadership and self-determination. So here I've just uh, noted a few that uh, resonate with the, the themes of, of environmental frontiers. So 
there's been high level uh, discussions uh, as a result of this program. They've produced knowledge products, engaged in direct dialogues and alliance building activities. Uh, and these organisations that have been involved, um, particularly ILO and IWGIA, supported participation in global and local events so that they uh, can talk about how they engage with the sustainable development agenda. And I've just linked uh, a webinar that uh, has people who've been involved in these pilot programs and how they feel that the programs have improved their participation, their voice in, in, in the local and uh, national context. The initiative was presented at the UN Permanent Forum for Indigenous Issues in 2019. Uh, and in 2020, the European Development Days uh, program in Brussels was uh, presented uh, by uh, the explanation of the program. It helped raise priorities identified at the national level to the global levels by all of the communities that were involved, uh, all these countries here. Uh, and it strengthens engagement with development actors as well. So Philippines, Bangladesh and Cambodia, they, they're very active. They've got, as you can see, a number of uh, proposals and projects being developed. These are a set of uh, people that were involved in the navigator training programs on the long community questionnaires in Cambodia. Here's uh, a plan that uh, Nepal communities have uh, participated in the research for, and they used that to uh, help the base for constructive dialogues with local and provincial governments, including access to funding, social services and protections, and local governments in some of the, in some of the areas committed to co-finance um, their projects, addressing all the 17 sustainable development goals, which is impressive. Two minutes. Yep, here's a picture of uh, you know another uh, capacity building uh, program. Did you say five minutes or two? Sorry. Two, two minutes. <laughs> oh my goodness! All right. So benefits for indigenous communities, of course, they they become engaged and gather a, a wide range of information on key issues, particularly about the impacts of climate change on um, food security, national resources, and agriculture. They uh, engage in dialogue with government institutions at many levels, and the government realizes that uh, they, it needs to bridge policy gaps. Uh, Bangladeshi government, to their credit, has, is beginning to understand the need to improve the visibility of Indigenous women and men in official data, and now 50 Indigenous communities are included in the population census, which it seems incredible at this late stage of, the, of uh, our history. But, Australia wasn't that far behind in the 60s. Um, so there's just some information about particular uh, research projects and reports on issues to do with Indigenous women and what their role in experience is. So that's, it's good that uh, those, uh, those communities of Indigenous women, human and uh, environmental rights defenders are uh, being targeted for a uh, special, special uh, focus. I'll just going to say that uh, this program is, is a powerful tool. It's accessible, raises awareness of issues uh, about rights or lack of rights and contributes to claiming of rights. It guides Indigenous people's self-determined governance and development strategies, holds states accountable and delivers data generates attention and action in relation to recognition and protection of Indigenous people's rights and strengthen engagement with development actors and states. Uh, as I said, there aren't any pilot programs in the Pacific as yet, and I think that's definitely an area that I think uh, needs some work. So thank you, I had to speak through that at the end, but thank you for listening. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Judith. And again, to everyone, as you're, as you're going through, please um, collect your questions and thoughts and then we'll put that and put those in the, um, uh, the Q and A as we go. Our next present presenters, uh, and we've got a three way three way talk here, so we'll have to manage the slides with great efficiency, which I'm sure we will. We've got Marama Maru Lanning, Kerry Mills, and Charmaine Takuri. Um, 
So I'll, I'll pass it. We've got various bios, but because there's three of you, I sort of feel I'm just giving one bio. So you might just give you give yourselves a little bit of a um uh, a pat on the back and talk about yourselves before you um before you head off on your on your um presentation. So over over to you three. That's our quick talk to us. Um, so, as an introduction, I'm Kerry Mills. I'm one of the researchers on the Marsden funded project on Māori relationships with harbours that you're about to hear two talks in relation to. Um, you might have heard, as led by Associate Professor Marama Murulaning, who will speak first, and you might have heard the um, quarter earlier in the week by Ngāhuia Harrison and Gerald Lanning talking about some specific case studies in our project. Marama and Charmaine will be focusing on the methodologies that we use in the project, and specifically the tikanga of research with Māori communities. It would be easy to do a whole talk on the topic of what tikanga is, and I would not be the person to deliver it, um, but sufficient for this very brief introduction, the root word of tikanga is tika, which means to be correct, true, and right. So adding na as the ending transforms the adjective into a noun, and tikanga is simply the right way of doing things. And you could translate it as traditions, as custom, is law, L-O-R-E, or law, L-A-W. It's also used to translate the word meaning in English. So if you ask what a word means in Te Māori, you ask, kia hatu tikanga o te kupu. So it's a really expansive concept, and it encompasses morality and fairness as well as custom. It's not just the designated way of doing things, but the morally right and fair way of doing things. But in academia, tika methodologies have developed under the banner of kaupapa Māori research which is led by education academics such as Graham Ngangaroa Smith, Linda Tukiwai Smith, Leone Pihama and others. Over time, principles of Kaupapa Māori research have developed, laying out a map of correct research protocols in Te Māori, ensuring that the research is led by communities in conjunction with researchers, that the research is seen by communities as valuable, that it's conducted in keeping with local tikanga, and that the relationships developed during the research are ongoing, personal, and nurturing. So our project looks at kaitiakitanga over harbours. For those who missed the earlier talk, kaitiakitanga is often loosely translated as guardianship, but it's a much more complex idea embedded in Māori culture. It includes rights as well as responsibilities, and it's based on the whakapapa or genealogical connections between all things. Um, and the first talk here by Marama Muru Manning, who's the lead on this research project and the director of the Jane Tenare Māori Research Centre that it sits within. Um, she's an amazing person, my boss and my friend, <laughs> and she's going to be discussing this idea of whakapapa as the basis of Māori research. I hand over to you, Marama. Tēnā koutou katoa. I see. Am I am I showing? Oops, you're gonna get it. Yes, yep. I know, but I've got to get these. Um, don't I have to do this? Just keep keep pressing your um shift or space bar, and it'll start to bring the animations up. Um. Oh gosh. Press the escape escape first. Escape. Escape. That'll get rid of the. Yep. Right. And then, now um, uh, enter or shift or your spacebar. Oh, look. There we Magic. Go. Bloody hell. Awesome. Okay. Tēnā koe, Kiri. Nā mihi ki a koe. Uh, kia ora, everybody. I'm Marama, and I work at the University of Auckland with these lovely people that I'm presenting with today. You're just going to see two of our team, but there's actually six in our research team. Anyway, here I go. Uh, 
mai Hawaii nui ki whanga parawa, huri ki tāmaki, ki whangarei, ka huki anō, ki tāmaki, fiti atu ki te mānuka nuka o Hoturoa, ka haere ki mōkau, ka taka te punga, ka huki ake ki kāwhia kai, kāwhia tangata, kāwhia moana, ka tū ko hani rāwa ko puna. This tauparapara, or poetic chant, which identifies places and ancestors, was created by my father for our research project to trace the harbour routes travelled by the Tainui canoe. Tainui is said to have been guided into Kafia Harbour by Pana Ira Ira, a kaitiaki and water guardian. The English translation is from Hawaii, the homeland of all Polynesians, to Whangaparawa, to Tamaki, to Whangarei, returning to Tamaki, crossing over to the Manukau Harbour, pro progressing to Moko, turning to Kafia, Kafia the waters, Kafia the sustenance, Kafia the people the resting place of the Tainui prow and stern. Our research focuses on kaitiakitanga and on harbours, stemming from the intersection of these in the Manukau Harbour claim led by the late Daimnaneko Minhinik, a Ngāti Teata leader. Her work was central to kaitiakitanga becoming a key concept in New Zealand law and policy. Our aim is to investigate kaitiakitanga as an ethic and flax root politic, emphasizing the work of community activists at multiple levels from the shores and waters of their harbors to the steps of parliament. The word kaitiakitanga is visible in texts from 1840 onward. The volume, Te Mate Puninga, a compendium of references to the concepts and institutions of Māori customary law by Benton, Frame and Meredith provides evidence of the term being used in native land court documents and early Māori translations of the Bible. In the 1980s, the word was mobilised by Māori rights activists in strategic campaigns to defend their lands and waters from environmental desecration. The term kaitiakitanga became included in policy in the 1990s. During a period in New Zealand's history of increasing neoliberal and third way politics. At this time, government sought to devolve many of its responsibilities to stakeholders. Now central to local government, now central and local government tend to use the term kaitiaki as a convenient Māori shorthand for stakeholder recognizing Māori interests and requesting their labor without relinquishing power or offering reward. Our research provides a rich understanding of kaitiakitanga, including its, origin, including its origins from actions described in Māori cosmology, creation narratives, and early genealogy to today, where the term is further contextualized by law and policy. Our work focuses on the critically important and threatened environments of harbours. When the first voyagers arrived in Aotearoa, New Zealand, they sought sheltered bays in which to draw up their canoes and come to land. Hundreds of years later, the first Europeans did the same. Our harbours are and have always been coveted and contested sites for navigation, industry, fishing, recreation and settlement. Historically, they are important places of meeting, negotiation and exchange. They are where land, sea and people come together. There has never been a comprehensive study of harbours and their significance to New Zealanders or to Māori. Most written histories of individual harbours, if they mention Māori history at all, sail over it swiftly and shallowly before moving on to a narrative about Pākehā and British settler industry. We are interested in the, in the stories local Māori tell about their harbours and their relationships with these harbours. And, and my slide there is showing you the three harbours that we're actually working at in Aotearoa in New Zealand. So how do local kaitiaki understand these places and how best to care and use them? Um, so this is actually a photo of our research group in Aotea Harbour, which is right next to Kafia Harbour. And a lot of these members, are, we have relationships with them through my, my pakapapa, which is my family relationships. So, and these are our local kaitiaki. So how do local kaitiaki understand these places and how best to care for them? Our case study approach, building from our established relationships 
with Māori communities in Kafia, Aotea, Manukau and, Whang and Whangarei is necessary to explore the local, ex the diverse local expressions of kaitiakitanga. Through our collaborations with local Māori from the harbours, we are investi investigating ways in which Māori knowledge and kaitiakitanga are understood. Whakapapa is a fundamental methodology in our research and we prioritise me and methods such as noho wānanga, which are group discussions, and hikoe wānanga, sharing knowledge while moving around land and sea territory, as well as other methods that Charmaine will touch on in the following presentation. The harbours we are working at cover a representative range of ecological states and threats, economic uses and inter-iwi relationships. Our focus on harbours allows us to look at dynamics of land and sea kaitiakitanga, as well as the multiple human relationships that are drawn together through harbours. Now, my new research for the project uses whakapapa, or genealogy, as a lens to analyse local stories and understandings which transfer knowledge from one generation to another. According to Barlow, whakapapa is to lay one thing on another, it is the genealogical descent of all things from the primordial gods and their children to culture heroes and ancestors and to people and events of the present time. Everything has a whakapapa, birds, fish, animals, trees, soil, sand, rocks, and of course people. Using a whakapapa perspective, I can see how all things are connected to form a whole. A harbour is not just a place formed to shelter and keep things safe, or merely a port or waterscape. A whakapapa approach enriches understandings of the relationships and connections that exist between the land and the sea and those people and creatures who dwell in this unique place or space. While my anthropology training included Western kinship theories, it does not include whakapapa, matauranga Māori or kaupapa Māori and tikanga, which Kiri spoke of in our introduction as legitimate methodologies or theories to analyse and organise knowledge. Yet as a novice, I must tread carefully, as the methodology can also reveal powerful histories and intimate details belonging to groups and individuals. So Noreira, I'll just show you like this map, that's Whakapapa in action, and it's growing and growing, and these are the original creation stories. And so now I'm going to hand over to Charmaine. Kia ora. So Charmaine, about, about three minutes um, all up. Oops. Sorry, what was that? About three minutes. Ah, okay. <laughs> that won't get me through what I need to talk about. So, um, so what I might do very quickly is I'll just skip the intro. So I work at the James Yanadi Centre um, with these wonderful people here, and I'm working on this project as well. But I'm also an MA student of anthropology while I'm working in there. Um, I'm going to show you something very quickly. So this is one of our methodologies that we work within at, at James Henari Centre, and it's a methodology that's been handed to us by, and gifted to us by Professor Ngā Pari Hopa, uh, who was the first Wahine Māori to receive her PhD at Oxford. And this model emphasises the relationships which Marama indicated are quite important to us in Te Ao Māori. Um, so the metaphor of this methodology is that of the spider's web, so which is strong and flexible, and it's also what sustains the spider. Furthermore, the spider can maintain it and mend it if it's ever broken, and while it's not truly mended to be exactly the same, it remains effective. So, the, And it's a functional, flexible, adaptable and dynamic web, which is how we also see this model working with what we do. Um, I'm going to try and skip through some things. So how do we put it into action? So we work through engagement, noho wānanga, whikoi wānanga, and dissemination. So what I really wanted to show was with engagement, it's the first step. It's not a one-sided discussion. This is an active negotiation with us within our Māori communities. Um, and our communities get to ask us questions after we've told them why we're there and what we aim to do. And they put four... Uh, forward options for consideration, uh, explore different outcomes with us, and we start to move into co-designing our, our projects together. Noho Wānanga are a little bit different to other meetings and focus groups uh, because they can last a long time, anywhere from a day to a week or more. 
Um, and within those noho wānanga, it's a space of sharing, discussion, storytelling, uh, both orally and performatively with waiata, song, motiatia, and haka. And it's a Māori, fra Māori framework that allows for collective knowledge transfer, construction, maintenance, and decision making. Uh, and then we also have our whikui wānanga, which is all of that plus some, which is when we go to experience the land with our communities and they get to share their histories and the reasons why those places are so significant. It's quite a special time to be able to do those things. Uh, all of these three spaces are emotive and come with lots of tears and laughter. The, the key point with these methods uh, is that the researchers, including lawyers and any other people who want to work with Māori communities, is that the power is shared. It means that everybody that we have to relinquish the power and work together and co-design. Um, what I really wanted to say is for us at the James Hinari Centre, our Flax Roots people, are our Indigenous people, and they're the most important for us to work with. They are the ones who are experiencing the effects of global issues on a day-to-day -day basis. And if we don't understand the impacts of these issues on a local level, how can we organize effective actions or set effective policy and laws to mitigate the issues? We need to ensure their voices are lifted and heard and not lost and forgotten amongst, amongst the discord of global sounds. Uh, that's probably a pretty short intro into some of the methods we do and it might not make so much sense because it's gone. So uh, feel free to ask us any questions that you might want to through there. Nō reira, uh, tēnā koutou katoa. I'm going to stop there because there was a lot more to say, but I kind of was trying to <laughs> trying to really get things down. <laughs> Great. That's um, yeah, fantastic. And um, uh, Kerry, were you, were you going to come in? Or you've done the intro. Great. I was I was just anxious you were going to come back again. Um, so so Charmaine, there's there's lots of methodological um, sort of questions that you might want to add, and I'd really encourage some of the audience to think about some of those questions. And I particularly like that um, spiderweb analogy in your in your method. So there might be a Dorothy Dixer coming up that might give you a little bit more time to um, to expand on that as we go. <laughs> um, just, but I'm, I'm mindful of time, just so everyone everyone has a um, a chance to present their, yeah. their, their great research. Yeah, so our nice. yeah, so our next our next presenter is uh, Trevor Dayer Winterbottom, um, and Trevor is an associate professor in law at the University of Otago. His research and te teaching focuses on environmental law and public law. He was the first New Zealand-based law academic to serve as deputy chair of the IUCN. Academy of Environmental Law, 2019 to 21, and is currently a member of the ILA Committee on Sustainable Resource Management and the WCEL Climate Change Network. So Trevor, over to you. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, kia ora, kia ora tato, kia ora tato katoa. I will put this on. What I'm intending to do over the next uh, few minutes is to give a brief taste of some interesting new directions that are beginning to unfold in New Zealand statute law. Uh, in the uh, heady days of the lead up to the Rio Conference on Environment and Development in 1992, uh, New Zealand was one of the first uh, jurisdictions to legislate for sustainability in the Resource Management Act of 1991. So putting forward this concept of uh, sustainable management, the, the centerpiece of the statute, and uh, having a, a balance between uh, uh, anthro anthropocentric uh, objectives and ecological objectives. We can see them laid out here in in section five of uh, the uh, Resource Management Act and having a key focus on uh, future generations, the life supporting capacity of ecosystems and addressing uh, adverse effects. One of the other key aspects of the, the RMA was firmly embedding in the statute uh, indigeneity. So really taking the lead from 
uh, how uh, that was playing out in, in the developing text of Rio at this time and building in the uh, firm homegrown New Zealand concepts. Uh, looking uh, at the relationship of Maori uh, and their culture and traditions with their ancestral lands. Uh, protecting customary rights in the coastal marine area. And uh, as has already been touched on by uh, Marama and her team, embedding this firm concept of guardianship, connecting between people, people being able to speak on behalf of uh, the land, the environment. One of the interesting uh, takes, particularly in relation to uh, the distinct relationship of Maori and their culture uh, with the world around them, uh, comes from uh, Justice Joe Williams uh, in our Supreme Court, who in some of his uh, extrajudicial writing has actually said that we can interpret this relationship in two ways. We can interpret it as a relationship of people with natural geophysical objects, or we can interpret it, um, as has been described by Mariman and her team, as a genealogical uh, relationship, that these special places, mountains, rivers, harbours, are actually ancestors. There, are the, there is that relationship too. So there's a whole complexity. As the uh, statute has uh, uh, gone on through its trajectory, uh, we have reached a point in time uh, through a review process that started in 2020, where there's now a distinct feeling that the uh, Act has not delivered. And it's not delivered through its subsidiary, as a framework statute, it's not delivered through its subsidiary instruments, either in, either in providing the desired environmental outcomes that New Zealand society as a whole would wish to see, or more particularly, giving effect uh, to those embedded indigeneity concepts and principles. The New Zealand High Court has uh, referred in a number of very recent ju judgments uh, in terms of those ind indigeneity principles as being Maori obligations, things that are there with real normative effect in the statute. What we have in terms of this uh, fresh look at things is again a similar moment of uh, serendipity uh, with the lead into the Stockholm Conference uh, plus 50 uh, in June of this year uh, that will hopefully reaffirm the Rio principles in a high level political declaration. So it's a real opportunity to look both at New Zealand law and how it's developing and how we're developing in an international context, both influencing international law and being influenced by international law. Uh, the reform project has progressed. The government has produced a uh, exposure draft of key provisions for what will be in a replacement statute, a natural and built environments bill. Uh, and that has progressed through a parliamentary inquiry before the Environment Select Committee that produced its report in November of last year recommending that the government proceed with this new bill. Interestingly, at the heart of this new proposed piece of legislation is a, quite a different and innovative way of looking at sustainability. Uh, as we go through the slides, I've highlighted in blue some of the concepts that were originally there in section five of the RMA, so we can see how they're tracking. It's very, a uh, distinct and different way of looking at things. Starting off first uh, with a, in a very loose uh, English translation of looking at the welfare and well-being of the environment, which again is a very uh, uh, ecological way of looking at things, much more firmer uh, than we have seen in statute law today. And also uh, embracing up front this idea of progression protecting and enhancing, uh, protecting without any ability for slippage or regression, enhancing and progression. So the, uh, that purpose will be uh, achieved in terms of the architecture of the new statute by prescribing environmental limits, uh, looking at carrying capacity, 
building interplanetary boundaries. And also, as we'll see in a few moments, again, uh, linking back to some real uh, key uh, focal points uh, of uh, normative Maori understanding. And it will provide for some environmental outcomes. So we'll try to pick some winners. There are some tensions here. I'll go on and talk about those later. Uh, and it will also address uh, adverse effects. In terms of, uh, uh, again, uh, embedding this whole concept of the welfare and well being of the environment in this new statute, uh, there's a real linkage. Uh, with the, the Maori worldview, the Maori view of the, of the environment around us, uh, focusing here in this, in this hierarchical statement, the health and, of the natural environment being paramount. That direct relationship uh, that Maori have with the environment and uh, the sort of centuries of uh, indigenous science and empirical learning uh, in relation to the environment which has a key into uh, thinking about planetary boundaries and environmental limits. Thinking of the environment as a whole in terms of its interconnectedness uh, and also thinking uh, again in terms of its capacity, its carrying capacity to uh, sustain life and its capacity uh, to absorb the effects uh, of how we use the environment. So we see here on this slide, uh, this relationship in, in terms of uh, uh, values and the aspects of the environment, the key environmental media of land, water, climate. Uh, also linking in people, there is an integral part uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the broader ecosystems. And also in terms of the wider connections, connections with planetary boundaries, connections with the, the environment, the international regulatory regime, and connections between uh, uh, production and consumption, and uh, how we uh, develop techniques uh, to manage the environment technologically. In terms of environmental limits, these are going to be uh, uh, prescribed by the Act. They'll be prescribed through some, some, through some subsidiary instruments, either a national planning framework or by some uh, natural built-in environment plans uh, produced by local authorities. Uh, notwithstanding that the fact that there is a, a, a focus on cultural values in the statute, Prescribing environmental limits at the moment is proposed to be limited solely to the aspects of the natural environment. So protecting cultural heritage, protecting cultural landscapes uh, uh, is currently not part of this limit setting. In terms of outcomes, uh, there are a range of outcomes that are uh, being proposed. Uh, some uh, ecocentric and some quite definitely anthropocentric. And there's a real potential for tension here in terms of these competing outcomes. It's envisaged that the, that the environmental limits will be paramount and will apply uh, to the broader context of how these outcomes will develop. But we can foresee a real tension between uh, providing for well-functioning urban or rural areas and protecting uh, and restoring the natural environment and cultural values, and also dealing with uh, reductions in GHG emissions. In terms of the environmental outcomes, the uh, select committee that looked at this exposure draft bill uh, focused on the synergies that could develop the, between uh, the various outcomes, but did recognize that it won't always be possible to resolve these conflicts. Uh, the committee went on and looked at some of the tools that might be available to assist us in, in that uh, conflict resolution process uh, and came uh, to the conclusion that decision makers should be required to take account uh, of environmental law principles. And taken from Rio, they listed a, a, a range of the key principles of we can see them here, precaution, uh, rectification of source, uh, polluter pays, uh, uh, and intergenerational equity featuring here. The 
uh, bill itself has as a placeholder, uh, and this is where both the government um, and its advisors are undecided as to uh, what the shape of this implementation principles provision should look like, and also where it should be placed in the statute and how it should operate. Should it operate at a high level in conjunction with that uh, central purpose of the well-being and wealth of the environment, or should it uh, apply at a more mi micro level just in relation to the preparation of those local authority plans? But we can see here built into it uh, some of the uh, key concepts from the RMA, and this is the place where guardianship is currently in put. Uh, arguably, this is potentially a retrograde step uh, if we compare this with the current location of Kati Akitanga uh, in, in, the, in the RMA, where it's directly linked to that central purpose of sustainable management. And here in the current framework of this proposed bill, it's much further down uh, the ordering of the step ordering of the statute than there in relation to the uh, subsidiary instruments. But we do see some flavor of uh, both the central concepts coming out. Uh, a new addition there, Matarang and Mary, referring directly to that wealth of empirical uh, indigenous science that's been gathered over generations and over centuries in terms of being able to think carefully about the carrying capacity of the environment and how we should set limits. Where uh, we uh, can come to almost uh, there with a conclusion is just to think about how uh, some of the uh, tensions have been resolved in the statute, in the jurisprudence under the RMA itself. There's been some very interesting developing uh, recent case law, particularly from the High Court and particularly from uh, some of the judges there. And I would highlight uh, Justice Christian Potter and also Justice Matthew Palmer. Uh, this is a selection of uh, the, some of the points that were uh, gathered together by uh, Justice Palmer in the Taranga uh, environmental case, which is all about uh, relocating some uh, uh, power lines across part of the Tauranga Harbour in a place where uh, they were impacting uh, on uh, some uh, particular Maori cultural values for the local people there. And picking out though some of the principles in terms of what the statute, current statute means, Justice Palmer put forward the view that essentially if we strip it right back, it's a statute that embeds in place both environmental and cultural bottom lines, environmental and cultural limits. Uh, at the heart of that is preventing adverse effects. And it's not just a sort of um, hierarchy of avoid, remedy or mitigate that's left there for people to pick and choose from. It's something that implies a real ordering and a real priority a hierarchy of effects. And we've seen this developing in relation to uh, our water law with the national policy statement on fresh water there. But only looking uh, at remedying or mitigating adverse effects where we can't avoid them. So avoiding, from, avoiding harm uh, is paramount. Is that a minute? And in relation to the Maori obligations, those uh, embedding of indigenous principles, now they're telling us that those are strong directives and they bring into, into play uh, environmental impact assessment in a, real, in a real way because there's an obligation where there is an impact to think as very clear, clearly as to whether there's an alternative way of carrying out an activity uh, that might be reasonably available. Where we come to in conclusion is this firm uh, principle of guardianship, relationship with the, with the environment. We've had some interesting case law from our Supreme Court in the Ellis case, which is not a, an environmental case, but it was a case where the court bench paused and looked at a legal issue and said, how would this look? How would this look from applying a tea lens? How would, how would we look at the law 
and framing a law and developing a law uh, through that. And arguably the Alice case um, I, unlocks these uh, you know, normative uh, Indigenous principles, uh, both for all members of New Zealand society and arguably as a common law gift uh, to the wider uh, international community through, compar through comparative law and comparative uh, analysis. It's firmly linked with principle 22 of Rio, and it's firmly linked with the provisions both in the current RMA and the proposed Natural Vote and Environment Act. And it's also linked in terms of when we think of what underpins uh, 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 the well-being and welfare of the environment, that uh, distinct requirement to protect and restore. And we see those words very, very firmly there in Principle 7 of Rio. So it really is a full circle journey, starting off with Rio in 92 and coming to reaffirming Rio uh, in uh, Stockholm plus 50 in June of this year. And some real potential here, some difficulties in uh, the drafting of a new statute, but some real uh, potential here for developing some new law and having a fresh uh, normative impact from the South Pacific going out across the rest of the common law and the other international world. Tenakutu, Tenakutu, Tenakutu Kavala. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Thanks, Trevor. Fantastic. So we've just got one more presentation uh, for today and for the symposium, um, apart from the wrap-up, which is later on uh, this afternoon. Asanka Amith Aransi, if I can pronounce that really poorly, and I'm sure you'll correct it, um, is a doctoral candidate here at, here at Macquarie University. And she's also a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Law at the General Sir John Kotelwara Defence University in Sri Lanka. And so I'll pass, pass over to you for the final 15 minutes. And again, I'll, I'll make some noise at about 13, 14 minutes as we're, as we're going through. Thanks. Thank you very much and a very good afternoon. Um, the title of my presentation today is Taking the Trails They Left, <clears throat> a proposal to revive ecocentrism in Sri Lanka. For all of you who haven't been to or heard a lot about Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka is a small island situated in the middle of the Indian Ocean. It has a remarkably rich biological diversity for such a small country, such a small island, and it is rich of natural resources. I thought I'd share some pictures with you of Sri Lanka so that you will have a rough idea about this environmental significance that I'm talking about. Uh, this is the Sigiri rock. On the top of this, there's an ancient castle built by one of the ancient uh, kings in Sri Lanka. This is the seascape in the southern part of the island. These are the stilt fishermen in Ahangama. And this is the Pasipuda beach in the eastern side of the island. And this is the Sri Lankan leopard, known as uh, scientifically Panthera perduscotia. And this is the magnificent Sri Lankan elephant, scientifically known as Elephas maximus maximus. This is just a glimpse of the um, natural beauty that this little island holds. However, the recent years have not been very great for the environment in Sri Lanka. That is mainly because of the administrative and governance decisions which focus mainly on the economic development and which basically had an anthropocentric flavor to it. Now, these are only two examples, uh, but I can provide a list of all these government decisions which prove to be very adverse to the environment. Uh, this is an unfortunate shift in the um, decision-making process of the country because historically it was more aligned with the ecocentric principles. And exploration into the historical sources uh, in Sri Lanka shows that the concept of ecocentrism existed in the very foundation of the Sri Lankan legal system even before the 5th century BC. For the purpose of my presentation, I opted for examples from the practices of the ancient rulers to establish that ecocentrism is deeply embedded in the ancient Sri Lankan governance process. The first example is something recorded in Mahavamsa, the Great Chronicles of Ceylon, and it shows how the attitudes of the ancient rulers in Sri Lanka were changed and shaped by the introduction of Buddhism in the 3rd century BC. Uh, 
In this particular story, Devanam Priyati, so one of the earliest kings in Sri Lanka, was on a hunting trip and he met with uh, Arahat Mahendra Thero, who arrived in Sri Lanka as a Buddhist missionary. The Thero, seeing that the king was in pursuit of a, a deer, preached him a sermon. I will read out the sermon, O great king, the birds of the air and the beasts have as equal a right to live and move about in any part of the world as though. The land belongs to the people and all living beings, though are only the guardian of it. Now, as the story goes, the king, after hearing this sermon, dropped his bow and arrows, renounced hunting and became a follower of Buddhism. Later, he would declare Mihintale area a sanctuary for animals, arguably creating the world's first ever wildlife sanctuary. This statement, this sermon later found its place in one of the most celebrated significant judgment by the International Court of Justice, the separate opinion of Judge Viramantan Gabzikawa Nagamaru's project case or the Hungary versus Slovakia case. In the judgment, his lordship held like this, the notion of not causing harm to others and hence sic uteritivo ut alienum non ledus was a central notion of Buddhism. It translated well into environmental attitudes, alienum in this context, would be extended by Buddhism to future generations as well and to other component elements of natural order beyond man himself, for the Buddhist concept of beauty had an enormously long reach. Now I will move on towards my second example, that is from King Elara, who ruled the country from 204 BC to 164 BC. According to Mahavamsa, the king had a bell hung above his bedhead with a rope hanging out of the window. Any of the king's subject who wished to complain the I'm sorry, who wished to complain the king about an injustice could ring the bell. One day, king's son, when he was on his way to kiss the reservoir in a chariot, accidentally ran over a cow. The mother cow, saddened by the demise of her beloved child, ring the bell, pleading justice from the king. The king's response unequivocally establishes that he saw no difference between the humans and the animals when the justice must be served. As the story goes, the king ordered his reckless son to be executed in the same way that the calf died and underwent the same pain, the same despair, the same suffering, the same sadness as had the mother calf. Now I will uh, show the third example that is from King Parakrama Baho, who reigned Sri Lanka from 1153 AD to 1186 AD. He urged his subjects not to lift at least a single drop of water flow into the ocean without being made useful for the benefit of earth. Now, this um, statement by uh, Parakram Bahu, Kim Parakram Bahu is often translated into English to mean for the benefit of the man, but the singular word lokopakarian means for the benefit of all earth, not just the human beings. Um, this quotation and the actions of the great king, which goes perfectly in line with the quotation, unequivocally showcase the earth-centric decision-making by the ancient kings in Sri Lanka. The king built a water reservoir known as Parakrama Samudra, or the Sea of Parakrama, the largest ancient tank in Sri Lanka, covering a water spread area of 2,100 hectares. Judge Veeramatri, in the same judgment, Hungary versus Slovakia, used the ancient irrigation system of Sri Lanka, which includes the Parakrama Samudra and around 30 other large reservoirs and 25,000 other small ones, as an example of sustainable development some 2,500 years ago. And interestingly, King Parakrama Bahu engaged in this development of irrigation systems, not only for the sake of human beings, but out of compassion for all living creatures. This is the uh, case for all of the Sri Lankan kings, not only King Parakrama Bahu. I will show you the final example. That is um, the work of King Mahasen. Uh, King Mahasen built this reservoir known as uh, Minneria Reservoir, and there is a wonderful phenomenon taking place in the Minneria National Park around Minneria Reservoir. Uh, what is this um, wonderful phenomenon? From the beginning of the dry season, that is in late August in Sri Lanka, in the dry zone, a number of elephants, they congregate around this Minneria tank to drink, to bath, and to feast on grass. And this phenomenon is termed as the gathering by the renowned Sri Lankan uh, naturalist behind the Silva Vijayaratna. And some sources consider this to be the biggest Asian elephant gathering. So this example provides, it, this example shows that how the efforts of the ancient kings to protect non-human beings are useful even today, several centuries later, for the non-human beings like the elephants. Now, it is clear that Sri Lankan history, the ancient Sri Lankan decision-making of the country is most aligned with the ecocentrism. 
However, these ecocentric principles cannot be seen in the modern or contemporary legal framework in Sri Lanka. This is unfortunate. But what is the reason for this? I don't think I would be able to point out the exact reason with 100% certainty. But if we look at the legal system of Sri Lanka, the legislations or the laws aimed at the protection of the environment are either enacted during the colonial times or in the post-colonial times. The indigenous legal systems of the country, on the other hand, have, be have become mostly obsolete, except three laws, Candian law, Thesavalami and Muslim law, which are applicable only with regard to the personal aspects like marriage, divorce and inheritance of property. They are not applicable with regard to the environment and the ancient legal systems, ancient ideologies are nowhere to be found in the modern legal system. So, I think it is accurate to say that Sri Lanka lost sight of the values and ideologies of the um, ancient wisdom, values and ideologies embodied in the ancient wisdom in the contemporary legal framework. The unfortunate thing is when the Western world is now emphasizing on giving a wider recognition to the ecocentrism, Sri Lanka is moving more and more towards extreme anthropocentrism. So my argument is, this ancient wisdom is not a mere uh, memories of a bygone era, it's not. To point out, Judge Veera Manchu once again, the ingrained values of, in, of any civilization are the source from which its co legal concepts derive and the ultimate yardstick and touchstone of their validity. The formalism of modern legal systems may cause us to lose sight of these principles, but the time has come when these must be integrated into the corpus of the living law. So I think this is the correct time, the perfect time for Sri Lanka to go back and to bring back or revive the ecocentric ideologies embodied in its ancient legal framework. How can we do this? How can Sri Lanka go back? I have three approaches. The first one, um, Ecocentric ideologies like rights of nature, uh, legal personhood of nature can be embodied in the constitution of Sri Lanka as it is done in Nicaragua, or it can be done through legislations as it is done in New Zealand and Bolivia. However, these two methods can be proved to be a bit daunting given the lack of commitment on the part of the legislature and the executive of the country to introduce innovative approaches to protect the environment in the recent years. The third one is judicial decisions. I think this is the most viable uh, way of incorporating ecocentrism back into the legal framework in the short term because in Sri Lanka, environmental jurisprudence is basically led by the judiciary. The constitution of Sri Lanka does not even contain a right to environment and it is recognized through creative interpretation of the judiciary. So uh, reviving ecocentrism, so judicial decisions seem like a more viable approach in the short term. Um, with that, I finish my presentation. Thank you very much. Fantastic, and you zoom through, <laughs> which was which is which is great. Um, so now's the time for general discussion, question and answers. And there's been quite a few questions um, that have been posted up on the um, Q and A Q and A site, and the and and the various speakers have been diligently looking and and, re and replying. Um, but as a way of just sort of kicking off some general discussion across, across all the panel members, I guess one of the great dilemmas I have, I guess, in my previous life as a practitioner um, as an, and, and now academic is reconciling this challenge around, you know, we're living in a modified environment. And when we start to think about what is the new standard, what is the new target that we should be aiming for? when we're trying to improve the condition of the environment, whether that's within our planetary boundaries, uh, pre-development. How do we do that with particular emphasis on Indigenous knowledges? And those of you with a legal mind, how would you codify it? Those of you with an anthropology mind, how does that, how does that knowledge come into our practice? And I think it, to me, it's a theme that sort of um, spreads across all these wonderful, wonderful presentations. So I'm not sure who wants to have a go, but it's sort of an open question for you all. I was going to say, maybe the New Zealanders like to have a crack. Their, uh, their legislation is more bold than ours is. 
I mean, I had a crack in my thesis and I realized it's quite hard to draft up legislation. So forevermore, I'm not going to be so critical of, uh, you know, why laws are, are wanting. But I mean, if you, can, if you can get the right words in laws, that's great. You've got to actually enforce them. So you've got to get governments who are bold enough to uh, pass the laws and then implement them. And then if, if not, that, that you get uh, judges uh, and deci other decision makers that will carry out the objectives as they're supposed to be. So what would the New Zealanders do? That's what I would like to know. You're, you're much braver than we are. I, I can comment from an implementation perspective. In, yeah, I think framework, framework statutes are common in terms of the, the environmental law world. We, we, we use them across, you know, I think, most jurisdictions. Uh, but they're problematic in terms of relying very heavily on both the presence of subsidiary instruments and also the quality of those subsidiary instruments. Um, and I think where you see failure of legislation, part of the failure uh, is either that essential parts of the architecture aren't there, or, or that uh, key parts of the architecture haven't been constructed terribly well. So it's a, it's, a it's a failing there. So obviously you can have a failing at a more macro level in terms of the legislation itself being flawed. But typically I think you see legislation being quite bold and uh, be able to be innovative because it's just sort of sitting there on the shelf and nothing's gonna happen until the subsidiary instruments come forward. The second comment that I'd make from a sort of broader legal perspective is how we look at enforcement and particularly criminal enforcement. And there's a real tension there uh, in that we tend to look at um, you know, prosecution and uh, culpability as a place of last resort. Uh, and we have strong sort of uh, arguments that culpability shouldn't be part of how we regard environmental crime. Now, uh, there itself, you know, you get the tension because the way that we're looking at crime uh, is in a very regulatory sense, you know, looking at sort of, you know, potentially significant harm to the environment in the same way that we look at uh, uh, enforcing a minor uh, traffic offence. Uh, and one of the interesting developments recently has been the proposal for an amendment uh, to the statute of the International Criminal Court uh, in adding the crime of ecocide uh, for significant harm to the global environment. And the interesting thing there is that goes direct to the heart of this issue as to culpability and applies uh, a culpability uh, test just like we would in terms of other serious crimes of uh, finding, finding perpetrators and uh, prosecuting for guilt for, for, for guilt for guilt for guilty intent rather than uh, strict liability and a downgrading to a regulatory uh, type of offence. Thanks, Trevor. From a from a socio-cultural perspective, and we've got a we've got a few um, exponents here with with that particular lens. How how does that social cultural element come in? And and I guess maybe maybe just as, as a little bit more leverage to the question. Um, Often when I think about the precautionary principle, it's, it seems to be more forward looking. Um, but I can certainly see arguments for the precautionary principle to be uh, looking back in time to capture social cultural values, expectations, uses, customs, practices. So therefore, is, that, is there a mechanism there? with a, a variation and you know Trevor was touching I guess some of it in terms of case law um Marama Charmaine 
Well, I'm going to, Charmaine, because I spoke for longer, I, would you like to answer the question? Um, <laughs> can I ask, so, so actually, I'd like you to say the question again, the way you framed it is, quite, is, is a little difficult for us to understand. So could you ask me the question again, please, Peter? Um, I'll, I'll try, but my memory, my uh, some, <laughs> others, others may, may have, have a firmer recollection. Yes. Part of it is, part of it is thinking about, um, you know, we have a modified environment um, yeah. as a consequence of development. And I think in part of your presentation, you were talking about the utility aspect of our ports and waterways. Yeah. Um, and in some ways that utility is juxtaposed to a more social cultural perspective. Yeah. So in thinking about those two quite different conceptions, how can they come together in a more constructive legal way? Um, and often I often, you know, I, I guess from a very selfish reason, and it might be one a, a question that Judith has clearly struggled with understandably, you know, when we're starting to think about creating new landscapes that are more sustainable, how can we do so that borrows deeply on cultural practice, but mm -hmm. doesn't make it impossible? Okay, so I'm very happy for Gerald or Kerry or even Lahuya to jump in here, but I, I'm just going to say something very quickly, and it's from my experience of, and it's part of the method. So uh, I was part of a Crown research project where we we were trying to establish what the Crown was because uh, in New Zealand and Australia and many other Commonwealth places, the Crown um, is different. And here in New Zealand, we have, um, Māori have a very unique relationship with the Crown and most of our relationships reflecting what we desire, you know, that, and outcomes in legislation and policy, uh, the mechanism through which we get a voice in the right places is through Crown mechanisms and through relationships that are set up for us by the Crown. But the thing is the Crown only wants to speak to certain people in Māori dom. It doesn't want to speak to all the Māoris. It doesn't want to speak to the local Māori that we were with yesterday in Kafia, who are the grassroots, you know, who are actually at these places that are going to be impacted by climate change and developments and, and tourist adventures. Those people that are there every day are quite far removed from Wellington, where the laws are made and where um, the Māori um, leaders, the bureaucratic leaders, the, the, the technocrats, are actually conversing with Crown representatives. And so uh, what really needs to ha happen so we can change and get um, more voices in this new type of New Zealand or this new these new type of sustainable environments that we want to create is actually change the mechanism that the Crown has created for us to interact with them. So is that when we want to create new laws around sustainability and climate change, that there is a closer lens or a closer relationship with the people who are every day impacted by these um, influences. So it would be a matter of deconstructing the crown framework that we have um, and the, the lawmaking mechanisms, which I'm not an expert in, uh, to deal with the unique specialised cases of Māori and all Māoris are different. Let's, you know, you every Māori group has their own aspirations. And as soon as the powerful people can recognize that that's what needs to be heard, that everyone wants, wants different stuff, um, then I think we are one step closer to creating better, more sustainable environments. I'll stop now. Anybody else jump in? I just wanted to ask one question about what you just said. Do you have a national? Uh, Indigenous or Maori body that kind of speaks at that national level with the Crown and then they might consult with local communities to take it up because you might have heard of the statement, the Uluru statement from the heart where they were proposing a voice to Parliament, which is a great idea, but I'm given our history, I'm thinking that's going to take a really long time, if at all. Or something like the Sami Parliament that they have in Europe is, is a great uh, example. So if you have some representative body that really is truly representative of all communities, which is a big ask, then they can negotiate uh, to have, you know, more decisions and uh, influence of uh, all sorts of uh, knowledges and communities. But we have so many. We have the Māori Council, we have the Māori Leaders Forum, we have the Māori Women's Welfare League, we, we have this whole rainbow gambit 
of Māori representative groups and they all have different priorities and they all have different um, uh, aspirations. And so we've got the groups, but we have one crown. You know, so maybe the crown needs to be more flexible, even more flexible than what it already is. And we can't chop ourselves up any more than what we are. It's really time for that institution to reconfigure itself so that it will work with us. That's what I'm going to put out there, which my legal people and my team probably don't go, Gerald. I we don't get rid of the crown. Do you want to say something? Kerry, did you want to say something? Oh, okay, no, okay, well, um, well kia ora coats. I wasn't expecting to say anything, so I'll be very brief. Um, so I'm kind of a lawyer on the Harbours team. And picking up on what Maram is saying about that, um, which I think is that a really important distinction between the people who don't get heard, the people on the ground and, and the official or um, you know, the, the formal institutions which the Crown tends to deal with and which uh, are often referred to as the kaitiaki, for instance, where you know, arguably they're not. Um, and so from a sort of legal perspective and certainly from a, a lawyer involved in this sort of work, very similarly, it's, it's about um, it's about listening, it's about being um, quite vulnerable and opening yourself up to hearing what people are actually saying and understanding how the law is impacting on their ability to be kaitiaki on, um, on what better ways we might be able to develop the law given what they're facing um, on the ground. And um, so I was just gonna mention that's a really important aspect from my point of view, that sort of being open to really listening and taking time to build relationships and try and really understand um, these issues on the ground. And within that, one of the things which has become very obvious to me through this work is that it doesn't matter really what you write, well, it does matter what you write in statutes, of course it does, but it's really important to start to understand what the, the normative, what, what the ethical, moral, whatever you call it, basis is for that law. And you know, with a lot of our environmental law, um, our regulatory approach, which is primarily the Resource Management Act in New Zealand, you know, underlying that, as I mentioned a couple of days ago, is this um, significant influence of property law and that the basic understandings that go with property law and the fact that you know, ownership and the rights that go with ownership are incredibly influential and powerful sort of normative um, influences in our, in our regulatory um, system and the decisions that are made, even though the Act doesn't actually refer to ownership rights. So it's, it's kind of really starting to understand what it means, what the law means for people on the ground um, and, and trying to unpack that and look for ways of kind of opening up the law, I think, to, to different ways of thinking and different values um, and yeah, sort of completely thinking differently about relationships with place, et cetera. So sorry, that was a bit of a waffle. Um, but it's a rather big question, Peter. <laughs> and, um, and Charmaine, uh, uh, just to draw you back to your spider web, just, just because I love that um, uh, imagery um, behind, behind your method. And it might speak to Gerard, um, Gerald's idea of capturing more voices. Thoughts? Yeah, it would. Uh, if they started to use a, connect, a relational connect, connection model like that, they will start to hear more voices coming in. And I was just thinking about how you were talking about the modified environment. Very quickly, environments that get modified are not talking to the local people. They're not necessarily actively listening to the flax roots, grassroots people who know the histories. They know what it, those areas mean to them, why they're significant and why, and if they could actually relinquish some power while they're talking to these grassroots people to be able to actually listen, they might actually be able to come up with a co-design that actually works and becomes more sustainable for everybody that needs to be there. That's the sort of thing that I'm hearing when I'm out and about with our team and our wānanga and listening to our local communities. A lot of things go back towards history and then very quickly you can see what the needs are within those communities and they can make those sustainable modified environments that way which then leads towards policy and law, I think. But if you use the methodology of the spider web, that's those connections that are leading out and bringing everybody back into the world. And then you can see where your methods are, where 
your important pieces are that you need to work on. I think there's there's a there's a follow up question that's that's come through the Q and A, and it relates to I guess the philosophical positioning of ecocentrism, and it's a it's a question that was um, positioned to Askana in terms of how those deep history ideas um, can be applied in a, in a more contemporary setting. Um, yeah, to, to me, it was, it was a really, it was a, a deep philosophical question about how far back you go in terms of those ideas, cultures, customs, decisions, and practices. Any thoughts? Well, what I think is um, this ideology is embodied in the uh, ancient decision-making process shall provide a basis for the development of the contemporary laws in the country. I mean, of course, the Western ideologies, of course, we shall incorporate, but at the same time, we have to give regard to these ancient values as well. So with regard to the ecocentric ideologies, now the world is talking about rights of nature, legal personhood of nature. What I'm saying is we need not to sort of borrow it from the world. We already have them in our legal system itself. What we have to do is just to bring them back bring them back into the um, legal framework governing the environment. So that's my answer. Yeah. I'm sort of mindful of time. We've got about sort of four minutes to go. Um, is there anyone else that, or anyone on the, on the panel here who's really has something that, um, that they didn't, didn't share, but want to um, put some ideas across and also um, in the, in the Q and A, and I'm just sort of moderating that as we go. Um, and you're going to say it's Friday, you're getting tired, but Trevor, you've unmuted. Fantastic. Uh, no, I haven't unmuted. <laughs> well, I'll put you on the spot. <laughs> um, so, so possibly to put you on the spot if, as I, as I, as I make, make the question, um, and Judith touched on it in terms of where, ca where case law starts to be really pivotal here, not, and not so much in the absence of clarity of definitions and objects, but how case law can be a bit more of a contemporary reflection on what, be, what might be coming out of socio or cultural uh, discussions. And this could be a sort of an open question to others here. Um, so is it the role of the judiciary to really drive through these indigenous in, in indigenous knowledges? Yes, and firmly because um, it's part of the law, uh, and the judges are there to uphold the law, not parts of it, but the whole of it. Um, and the interesting thing that you see, I think, in this area, is similar to what you see in in some of the climate change litigation cases. In the climate change litigation cases, you see the judges who grasp the issues being very bold and looking comparatively across a whole range of jurisdictions and different decisions from courts and taking inspiration and moving the law forward. And in terms of, say, the concept of indigeneity, really you get a bold and creative judge they pick it up and they, and they grasp it and it can develop exponentially. So for example, in the New Zealand context, you know, we've had Justice Fodder saying, if you've got a you know, real uh, cultural relationship, you've got to go off and ask the people affected, work out what the relationship is, what are the values, how should the values be interpreted, ask them about it. And you know, if they're telling us from uh, you know, their own cultural evidence that there's a real impact, then that impact needs to be addressed in some way. It's not open for a decision maker to reinterpret it in some different way. And we've seen that line of authority being picked, being picked up by other judges. And perhaps the best example would be um, the summary that's in Justice Matthew Palmer's decision in the Taronga Harbour case, where he distilled about 20 or 30 years of real leading uh, 
jurisprudence about half a dozen really key cases and synthesized it together. Um, so the law can be dynamic and it can have real impact and it can pick up on those things. Uh, and it's an, interest, it's an interesting area. And I think it's got a similar dimension to how climate, how you see the potential of climate change litigation. You've got a real potential here to um, uh, not nudge the law, but move it forward in, in sort of big jolts like an earthquake. Might be getting myself into trouble here, but I do actually think there is a great room and there's a great history for um, judges to make law. I mean, Paul might disagree or Michelle <laughs> um, or Trevor, uh, but often uh, judges give uh, the, the extra explanation of, of interpretations of statutes and constitutions and things like that. There are plenty of examples, not just in environmental, but native title cases, uh, land rights uh, legislation, um, merit reviews, um, when you have environmental impact statements, uh, that's another way of uh, getting voices. Uh, and sometimes there are case, cases about, uh, you know, whether or not uh, consent should be given and, you know, the interpretation of whether the EIS was adequate and whether it covered a lot of voices. But I think, generally speaking, you could say that um, these perspectives are gradually coming into uh, interview and people are taking note of them, but uh, it's not a direct, it's not a direct pathway necessarily, but there's definitely uh, good directions on that, I think. And that's a probably a great, a great spot to um, wrap up this, this session. So I'd like, on behalf of all the audience, um, thank you so much to all the presenters. Um, for your rich insights, your case studies and your observations. That was um, certainly from my perspective, um, mentally challenging for a Friday afternoon um, and a Friday evening, particularly for our New Zealand friends. So, so thank you very much.